That's I don't fun. think I, I have anything. I just do faces. I, I start with characters. It's yeah. what about the me. what about the gabo, Joe? No, do I don't that? default to drawing the no. gabo. I draw the gabo very deliberately when I need to. Um, mm. It used to be when I was in high school, I would default to drawing trees, but that's because I actually wanted to draw big titty anime girls, but I was too embarrassed. <laughs> um, but the tree now... is the second best thing. <laughs> everybody and welcome to another brand new episode of the overly sarcastic podcast this time a very special bonus episode the artists episode where uh, we have two very special guest stars who are also artists and we are lacking the one uh, member of team osp who is not an artist and uh is currently gallivanting off somewhere in europe uh so <laughs> in yeah his suck absence- it blue yeah, <laughs> we're here to talk about cool stuff like sitting at desks for hours at a time and yes. not talking to people. So, we... uh, our our lovely guests today we have Joe and Echo. Hello, hello. hello. Uh, should I introduce myself a little bit? Uh, um, f- please feel free. Sure. <laughs> I normally don't do this part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> normally, I'm the one who gets to heckle. So, uh, yeah. So I'm uh, Echo Gillette. I go by Echo is Weird online, um, and I run a very artsy, crafty kind of channel on YouTube. And then I also do a little bit of like Twitch, and I'm on Twitter far too much. Yeah, um, aren't, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> At this point, any amount of Twitter is too much. Yep. <laughs> How about and you, Joe? Joe. Yeah, oh Joe. yeah, I am. I am Joe. I go by Joe Cat online. I have been doing things not as long as echo has although i am um, i guess like you could consider me an animator <laughs> slash variety content creator on youtube uh yeah. sort of the craft guide stuff. videos and assorted other extremely fun yeah content. dungeons yeah. and dragons final fantasy gaming uh just all that all that good nerdy stuff yeah heck yeah and Red, what do you do? <laughs> oh, God, that's right. Yes, uh, I do the drawings on Overly Sarcastic Productions uh, whenever there's a little chibi head or a character on screen or the videos that I make where it's sort of like an animatic. That's me. And I do a comic on the side called Aurora, oh, which I, I draw. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I don't talk Ooh. about it very much. Um, the la- when I mentioned it on the channel, it broke my website for three weeks because people kept going <laughs> to it too much. And I had to message my my like host and be like, hey, my website's breaking. Um, what do? And they were like, well, the script does not allow me to tell you that you're overloading our servers because our servers have to seem very good. But if you <laughs> were perhaps to upgrade to a slightly more durable hosting plan, this would probably stop. And I was like, OK, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was fun. I was actually working on that right before we did the pod because uh, I just got back from a rather beefy trip that took a lot of time out of my work week and uh so i sort of have to play catch up right now um it's fun fantastic sorry now i'm googling your web comment no no (laughs) bookmark it i'll link it in the show notes below for any listeners you might want to check out aurora damn it Uh, yeah, but we've got we've assembled quite the team of artists here today, uh, and I'm here to read some questions for them because you guys have submitted a ton of art related <laughs> oh, yeah. questions through Ask OS Pod, and we're here to just answer them, chat about art and whatnot. Some of them are more tangential than others, but I think that rocks. So we'll see Perfect. how this goes. Uh, but why don't we jump right in here with a question from Lady Katie? I'm a new artist trying to learn how to draw. Right now, I really want to focus on drawing people, mainly so I can draw D&D characters. <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit grasping the basics and want to know if you have any tips for body p- proportions and stuff like that. Love the channel and all that you guys do. Any tips for sort of someone starting out grasping the big- basics of anatomy and proportions and whatnot? Hmm. Who wants to hmm. go first? I can go first. This is a really yeah, good question. Go, go ahead. Um, so the way that I was taught to do figure drawing um, by my mom is literally starting from the inside and going out. So, like, oh. drawing a lot of skeletons. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Like, we'd go to the museum, and it's like, all right, I'm going to plop you down in front of this diplodocus. Have fun. Um, <laughs> so you don't need to go into that much detail, but that'll give you a really accurate idea of literally how a skeleton is put together. Yeah. What angle the skull sits on the spine, you know, uh how the rib cage works and where it stops and that sort of thing. Um, so that's just a really good place to sort of start. And considering most uh, most art tips for getting anatomy right involve sort of doing a little ball and socket jointed yeah, skeleton. The little underneath. stick figure base. Yeah, the little stick figures. Um, 
So starting from an understanding of how the actual underlying skeleton is put together can be extremely helpful. Um, and after that, m musculature is a little harder to get a feel for. It's more complicated. It's so important, though. But yeah. I hate I hate how important it is, like to understand how the muscles link yeah. together. That's the one where like there there are plenty of tutorials for like the ball and socket joint, how to pose your figure, and then for the muscles, nobody agrees. It's like you can kind of make an arm look like a chain link or something, or maybe like look at this back muscle diagram. There's like big panels. I don't know. It, it's hot nonsense. But after you kind of get a feel for it, you'll have a better time. You'll be able to look up reference images and understand what you're looking at, what connects where. Um, it's just a really good idea to sort of start with that. And then yeah. after that, a lot of live figure drawing would probably behoove you. <laughs> I was just about to suggest figure drawing. Is, I um... want to do more figure drawing. Like Joe knows this. Like I have issues with like um, figure drawings in space just because I don't have that uh, like life drawing uh, I never took a life drawing class when I was in college. We did, mm. like, some gestural drawing and, like, uh, very technical drawing. But I have never, like, sat down and just drawn people. And you can tell if you, like, really stare at my art for extended periods of time, you can tell that I'm lacking that, like, fundamental underlying, mm. like, drawing people in 3D space. Also You're good because, at polish, uh, though. I'm very mm. good at polish. And that's, like... You can you can fake you can fake good art if you can polish well enough. Um, oh, I mean, yeah, that that rendering uh, step yeah. when it's just like we're gonna make this look beautiful. The underlying yeah, art can, can be whatever. You can <laughs> but, have some like bad anatomy if you can polish it well enough. Um, but like, yeah, uh, all of the people type drawings, the like, uh, what is it called? Uh, figure drawings of people that I've done has been from like still images and flat images, flat references. Um, yeah, there are also uh, people who make their living online, uh, basically just taking stock photos, not stock yes. photos, but like yes. pose yeah. references. references. And so, yeah, yeah so like uh, there's one girl, oh, I cannot remember her name, but she wears, she'll wear this like skin tight suit that has lines on it. So you can see where like all of her like body proportion is Ooh. like broken up. And then she'll take photos in like various different positions, specifically for artists and she just has like a massive catalog and you can like just Google and find people like this all over the internet, but they're really good for practice. If you that's need pretty brilliant. pose references. Yeah. I, that, that's all I was going to say. If you're, if you want to draw people, a uh, gesture drawing course of some kind, or like learning to gesture draw from, and if you don't know what gesture drawing is, it's just feeling out. It's more so just kind of, feeling out the shape of the thing that you're drawing rather than trying to draw it accurately. Um, yeah. yeah. When I took my gesture drawing class in college, my professor kept uh, uh, telling me to exaggerate the shapes because I was trying to draw it kind of as I saw it. But she was like, no, no, no. You see how there's like this little curve on the arm? Exaggerate that so you can like really feel the shape that... It's, it's hard to explain. How do you feel the shape when you're drawing on a 2D, you know, flat yeah. paper, you know? But I mean, I, I also have never taken a proper, like, figure or gesture drawing class. Uh, I do recommend it. It's a very good idea. Um, but a lot of what I've done has been sort of, like, either self-referential drawing. I, um, sometimes I'd do, like, I'll just take a video of myself doing this thing. I'll find, the like, the right frame yeah. or watch through the scene. I, <laughs> I spent, like... A couple hours one point just doing combat rolls because I needed to get across this really complicated like this guy's doing like a diving roll with a spear in his hand what and I was just like well I I know one way to get the reference from the right angle mm -hmm. um that's so. such a good idea because I forget like I have a body I can just use it as <laughs> a reference like I have mirrors I have the technology yeah self-portraiture is a very good way to just get a beginning feel for that like and especially with the benefit of, like, easy camera access. You can draw your face from angles you can't necessarily get in a mirror. I did a ton of hand drawings when I was a lot younger because I just couldn't get a feel for it. And then something clicked, and I was like, all right, I think I got this. Um, but that, that thing about not getting too stuck on this needs to look exactly like it does in real life. Like, the, the scientific illustration approach is, like, this has to look exactly like it does to my eyes. But a lot of figure drawing is stylization because drawing a character in motion is not the same thing as picking a frame that would be the still image in an animation of this character moving and then drawing that. Yes. It won't communicate the weight or the movement correctly. So 
So stylization and feeling it out, like you said, it's it's a little hard to describe exactly, but when you kind of get the pencil on the paper, it's like, oh, there's like a weight to this line. If I draw it this way, it feels heavier. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and what Red said earlier, a very important word, reference. Reference, reference, reference. Yes. It, is, yes. it makes your drawings look infinitely better, even when you may feel like you're not at the skill level enough to achieve like a certain pose yeah. or anything like that. Um, I don't know if this is blasphemy to say, but if especially if you're just starting out and uh, this might be a hot take, actually. If you're just starting out and you feel as though you're very amateurish, I would say learn through tracing. Like, mm. just like, e I would say even learn if you don't. tracing photographs. Yeah, yeah. photographs. Don't yeah, trace yeah, other yeah. people's photos. photos. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't trace, trace art. art. Trace photographs uh, because uh, that's the whole thing as well is like reference real life images rather than reference other people's drawings unless you're yeah. this goes into a deeper conversation about like learning your own style but if you're yeah. just like learning to draw in general I would say it's okay to trace to like see how like maybe a, a piece of cloth folds or mm -hmm. see how a foreshortened hand looks um, but only to, to practice I wouldn't yes. I recommend trace to like make published work or anything like that because it's and, gonna be very obvious yeah um, and also since we just discussed how important it is to stylize to communicate what you actually want the figure to look like even if that's not necessarily what it would look like in a photo tracing is not actually sufficient for the purposes of art like it, it's not like the yeah. ideal scenario would be to yes. perfectly trace it you uh, so what i recommend doing is tracing the thing you need first then um <laughs> Well, I, I suppose tracing paper is a little bit old hat at this point in this era of digital art. But then you like remove that or remove the reference image from behind it and then redraw it f using what you've traced as the reference. That's, like, a, oh, bit okay. of, that's a better like suggestion, I, actually. Well, yeah. well, like, like I traced this arm, but if I redraw it like this, you can actually see the underlying musculature when I couldn't see that in the image. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and with, with regards to the question about developing your own style, I, my approach towards art and my, my kind of theory on this is that everyone's art style is essentially the sum of every solution to a problem they've ever yes. figured out. So if you trace or even reference somebody else's art, you're using the problems, the solutions they've figured out for the problems they encounter. Like, I don't know how to draw this pose or I don't know how to make this back muscle look right. And then they figured something out. And if you reference their art, you're essentially using their solution without coming up with your own. It's not inherently yeah. bad i mean tracing so other people's art is i mean just don't don't steal other people's art yeah it's <laughs> a it's that. a deeper that, conversation that's like the one thing but but yeah i'll yeah. i'll jump on what red was saying and essentially you are stylizing a st already stylization it's it's going to be derivative and it's mm. you might not fully understand why this artist is drawing it this way because yeah. they most likely if they're a very good artist might have come to that style themselves looking at you know real images and real references of, of real life and uh, live action and that is the solution they've come to and so yeah so that that whole tracing thing is with a big fat asterisk uh, <laughs> yeah. that, boulder of salt <laughs> yeah you you should you know if you reference real life you will come into your own style um, yeah. yeah, I guess this has all kind of been dancing around the next question we had here which is about finding your style as an artist uh, it comes Ooh, yeah. from Adrian um how did you find your art style? Is it based on an art style you've seen before? Is it a mix or is it something you came up with? It kind of seems like you guys have already talked about it a little bit. It's Red, you were saying this like the stuff you consume. Yeah, yeah Echo, go. please. The best advice that, or I, this was just a thing I think I saw on Twitter like years ago, but the thing that helped me so much in terms of like me feeling like I don't have a style is that someone tweeted something along the lines of everything you draw is in your style because yeah. you're doing it. And it's, that just kind of clicked for me where it's like, okay, yeah, everything that like, I'm going to draw things in a very specific way just because it's coming from me as an individual human being. Um, I just have to pick the things that I like the most and then push those. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of beginner artists especially get very worried about developing a unique style, not really realizing that Nobody sits down and is like, all right, this is how I'm going to do hair and this is how I'm going to do eyes. It's like, like you might start out that way, but after a while, it just turns into problem solving. It's like, I need to draw hair moving this way. I guess I'll try this. Oh, that worked great. I'll do that from now on. Or like, I, I draw eyes this shape, but I can't make them do this expression if I stylize it too much this way. So I'll do this for that one. And then the more you practice it, the more these... It's kind of like you, you start with these like rigid delineated chunks of 
this is how I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to do that. And the more things you draw, the more you sort of sand off the edges and, and yeah. smooth it all together until it's one coherent thing. So it doesn't look like you're essentially snapping between different solutions when you have to draw different things. Uh, and that's just, pre- ugh, sorry, that's just a matter of practice. Like, the, it, you know, you can't really, yeah. you can't really shortcut your way to it because it's literally just developing the muscle memory in your hands and, and in your artist's eyes. Um, although I will say it can be very funny to be like, this person's art style has evolved a lot, but they started off drawing an awful lot of warrior cats. And sometimes you can just <laughs> tell. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> or like Disney princesses, you can always tell around the eyes if they did a lot of yep. Little Mermaid or something like that. Yeah. Um, just little things stick with you. That's like how you can tell uh, when an artist draws not safe for work. There's just <laughs> yes, yeah. there, there's just a voluptuousness <laughs> about the way that they draw things in general that you're yep. you're like you draw a lot of boobs. I can tell. <laughs> there's a way they shade the skin. There's something mm-hmm. about the expression. It, it's just there. But uh, but no, yeah, yeah. The way that a style develops, it just sort of, you know, eventually it smooths over and and becomes visible in all parts of the person's work. Uh, yeah. Very derivative. Uh, or rather, not derivative. Um, oh, what's the word? When it, like, slowly changes, kind of like evolution. Um, um, what, like, developed? Oh, I can't find the word, but it's... Like, I mean, it does evolve. Like that's it, a good it does way evolve. I'm yeah. trying to find the word. I- iterative. Like that's the word. It's very, okay. Your art style will be iterative. You might not see it like as it goes on. Sorry, that was that wasn't even the question, was it? The question was how did you co- develop your style or come, how did come to you your... develop your? I know a yeah. joke because I know you very well. A big <laughs> thing that is part of your style is that uh, you use a very specific brush because it makes art easier. Ooh. And uh, that, that yeah. That's also very connected to your style. Yeah, that's been a more recent development that I've only started doing like in the past couple of years is a specific type of line style. And that, just like with Red said, is a solution to a problem I've come into Mm -hmm. and thus has become a part of my style is this kind of sort of rough crayon-y looking uh, line art. And yeah, it's not like I set out to make that a part of my style. It is a solution that I've come up with. So Mm -hmm. yeah, just like what Red said... um, my style has been developed over the course of figuring out solutions to certain problems. Like, hair is too detailed? Okay, I'm just going to add just a few lines of detail uh, mm. and make it very flowy because that's fun for me as an artist to draw very flowy hair. Um, yeah, preaching to the choir on that one, I think, <laughs> um, in this room. But, uh, yeah, I actually I have a maybe a slightly weird answer to this because I do actually remember being very concerned about developing my own style when I was young. Uh, and it was because I read a lot of newspaper comics and a lot of them looked very different, but a lot of them looked like different in a way that didn't make sense to me for stylization. It's like I love Calvin and Hobbes, but I'm like everyone's arms are noodles and everyone's eyes are dots and I don't get it. And the hair, it doesn't even, it's not even fully outlined sometimes. What's happening? Um, So I would, when I encountered a style I didn't understand, I would try to figure out how to emulate it. Uh, Not necessarily make it my style, but be like, all right, I don't understand this. I want to know how it works. How can you make a body look good when it has no underlying anatomy and musculature? Like, you know, cartoon characters that are just all, you know, rubber hose animation or, you know, it's all squash and stretch. It's like, I don't. I don't really get this. It's it's not it's not put together because I was learning how to draw from the inside out. And I was like, where would you put the skeleton? Whereas nowadays that's like the funny ha ha extra dark meme of like, look, I drew a skeleton on Charlie Brown and doesn't he look weird? <laughs> um, and I remember like like kind of going down this road for a while until eventually I was like, you know what? I don't like this. And I just stopped. Um I also remember the first time I picked up a, a Shonen Jump issue and saw manga style for the first time, and I was like, oh, this makes no sense. Now I'm really curious how that works, because <laughs> uh, cause when you read a lot of newspaper comics, everything is kind of, Flat. I don't know, yeah, but also everything's very uh, curved, sort of. Everyone's uh, got, like, yeah. noodly yeah. limbs and, and, you know poofy hair and big round button eyes and then I was reading fucking steam detectives and everything was sharp sharp edges and then I found Yu-Gi-Oh and everything was even sharper and I was like I don't understand this at all how does this work like you draw an eye with straight lines and it doesn't look good but this makes it look good so how does that work and and sort of going down that little conspiracy rabbit hole eventually turned into something that I actually liked but it didn't look like anything that I've been trying to figure out before because the, the art was a problem I was trying to solve, and my solution didn't look like the art. Mm-hmm. Similar to Red, I just, like, 
growing up, uh, I grew up in Thailand. So Thailand has a lot of um, leftover media from Japan and mm -hmm. China. So I did also consume quite a bit of anime and just like like the style and very similarly derived my art to look like that. It's like, I like how that looks. I'm going to make it look like that. But then over time, um, as I've been going into more animation, I've started fleshing out my art from an animator's point of view. That is to say, very recognizable silhouettes, because that's something you learn about animation, is you learn how to... It's just a succession of poses, right? Mm. So you want every pose to be very good, and I've tried to apply that to both my character design and my posing when I try to draw art, is if this were silhouetted, would this look good? If this character were silhouetted, would they look distinct from this character? And then that's how I've started applying both my character design and posing, because design and posing is also part of your style. That's the whole thing. Like, a style is such a vast like <laughs> what is part concept. of your art style right what isn't yeah. so that's that's how i i think i'm not come to my style because i think a style is always constantly evolving you know yeah um and well, there's always more problems to solve always <laughs> like, more problems to <laughs> you solve. figure out figures and then it's like how do trees work it's just a nightmare yeah. <laughs> everything is a nightmare <laughs> i am currently on the foreshortening hurdle right now mm. so uh but yeah like that's the that's the whole thing with um, Picasso, right? Is like he started experimenting because he already knew how to draw things realistically. So then yeah. he started to solve problems a different way, or I guess just come up with new things. Visual. Yeah, experiment. Yeah. So yeah, that that's a thing that I think I'm going to go back to actually is relearning to do realistically so that I can learn how to apply it in a style instead. Yeah, realistic drawing is, I think, kind of the the central point from which all styles spring, essentially, because the whole purpose of, of visual art is I want to portray something specific to an audience. I want the audience to understand what, I, what I'm making this look like. And it's like your handwriting. Like, your yeah. handwriting is derivative of how you most comfortably write the, the you know, letters in your alphabet and your language it's yeah. you probably could write uh and make it look like Arial or times new roman but you don't because you write in a way that's comfortable for you and yeah, art mm -hmm. is the same way and as long as people can read what you're writing you can do whatever you want with it so yeah. in the same way that like as long as people can kind of parse the visual art that you're drawing it doesn't matter if it's noodly or if it's photorealistic it's you know it's all about the audience being able to get what you're doing yeah, it, it, I had a phase for a while where I, I'm glad I'm over it now that I used to look down from my ivory tower and shame upon extremely stylistic styles, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the noodly arm. Um, best example I can give is like Adventure Time, where oh, they yeah. uh. almost never uh, abide by typical anatomy. And now, now that I'm more mature and actually understand art, I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that style, you know? It doesn't have... Your style doesn't have to abide by realistic anatomy or anything like that. Grant, uh, given that you already understand those rules and stuff, you know, it's like you got to know the rules to bend and break them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Also, I feel like uh, the like, like that simplistic style, like the um, Adventure Time style, is good for animation because it's yeah. so simplistic and over -stylized. That's another thing. Like, yeah. Red, you're just so smart. You've already set this up by saying that it's problem solving and that's literally yeah. it. Like, Adventure Time's style is a result of the medium that it is in, animation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of horror stories from comic creation about, like, I designed this great character design, and it's a nightmare to draw more than once yes. on a single page. There's, oh like, my some, gosh, yeah. some, like, comic character that's named, like, the Harlequin, and his uniform had a friggin' diamond pattern design, and it's like, can we just kill this guy or, like, <laughs> drop him in a vat of dye or something? Because if I have to draw one more panel of this fucking Harlequinade with tiny diamond patterns all over him, I'm going to shoot somebody. <laughs> so you guys just... have once again wandered right into the next question I had on the yes. list, which oh, is perfect. about complicated character designs. Uh, this one comes from uh, Impulse Feral Gremlin. As someone who made a D&D &D character with a super complicated design and then had to tone it down because it was way too hard to draw and then had to tone it down because it was way too hard to draw more than once, how do you deal with drawing complex character designs potentially multiple times? Aurora has been a huge inspiration to me and has helped me many times when I get low on the creative juices, and I imagine you might have some tips, tricks, as some of the gods, goddesses' designs are pretty complex. Thanks in advance. Love your vids. They make my day. How do you guys deal with 
complex character designs? Do you avoid them? Do you seek them out? I was when... just going to say, my solution is that I don't because I'm an animator <laughs> and uh, I literally cannot do that unless I ever wanted to do a very specific type of um, short animation of a complex character. Um, I don't know. I, I guess my solution is um, think, uh, value your priorities, measure, mm. measure your priorities. Um, do you feel like you're only ever going to draw this character once? Then go nuts, like add all the details you ever want. But uh, I guess th this artist must have already figured that out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, part of this is about the medium. Um, mm -hmm. For in instance, there are, there's a lot of like, video games and, and video game adjacent things and 3D animated media where the characters have extremely complicated designs because they only need to be designed once. You know, if, if you're basically 3D modeling a character and then rigging them up and then puppeting them around, then you can have as many belt buckles and plaid texture patterns on them as you want and it's fine because all the hard work was done in the modeling stage and then, you know, it does not... It's not harder to animate a character with an extremely complicated textured outfit than it is to animate just a simple ball and socket joint placeholder model. Like, you're doing this exact same amount of rigging. But if you are a 2D animator and you have to draw all of those frames, that is a huge difference. So, in like, gotcha games where, you know, you only see the character art once, uh, then you can be as detailed as you want because you're only drawing it once. But if you have to 2D animate that character, or even draw them, it's a very, very different beast. So, a lot of it is just the limitations of what you're using this character for. Um, so the, with the specific reference of like, hey, some of the gods in Aurora have very complicated designs, most of those guys don't show up very often. Um, and you can get a lot of mileage out of just adding a slightly complicated texture to what is otherwise a rather simple outfit, where it's like, oh, she's got these big flowy sleeves, but I sort of made them look a little bit translucent, and that already makes this look more complicated than it is. Because all I'm really doing is drawing a pretty simple gown and then going in later and like, partially erasing the underlying uh, color block layer so that you can see the background there. It's like that part's not complicated. And that character's not showing up very often. And when I do have characters that I have to sh feature a lot, I either find shortcuts to make their outfits less complicated for me to draw, or I change the outfit so it's less complicated mm -hmm. for me to draw. Because the thing is, there's... I think there's this sort of, like artist macho you get sometimes where it's like i'm gonna do this right i'm gonna put in all the hard work and i don't care oh, how long it hundred takes. i'm the full hundred percent mm. that the full hundred percent is hard yeah but that's the thing like you can you can give it a hundred percent for a limited amount of time and then after that you sort of have to weigh some options um i i remember the moment this clicked for me actually because i i had that feeling it's like i want to do this right i want to make every panel as good as i can make it you know, I, I wanna I wanna put in all that work. And I was watching it was a it was a corridor crew animators react video, and they were reacting to the thief and the cobbler. And of course, that's like the legendary animated movie that Aladdin undercut completely intentionally, because somebody was hand animating it for years and years. All these incredibly complicated sweeping environmental shots being hand drawn panel by panel. And then after that it was like, well, Disney just got a team of about a hundred times as many people on it and they just made it faster than you and now everyone thinks you're going to be mm. copying them which is just huge like obviously it's like oh thief and the cobbler is like the true artistic vision and disney's aladdin is like the cop-out cash grab you know just kind of and like yes that is true but the guys who were watching this were like my god that's so much work that's not in, not in like a prideful way it's like that like, you might finish it, but what else are you going to be able to have time to do in a right. single human lifetime? Like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's impressive. But also, it's stupid. It's like, why would you do it this way when you could do it in a more efficient and faster way? And that was this sort of, like, it clicked for me. It's like, yeah, hold on. You could do it the macho, cool, artistic vision way, or you could do it a different way, maybe. Yeah, or like you could have, have, more have time left in your life. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, obviously, like, that's, there's a degree to which shortcutting the art can undercut the quality of the art. Corridor Crew got in some trouble for that recently, so I'm not just saying that I'm mm -hmm. fully on board with that stuff. But, like, there is, this is a sort of cost-benefit analysis you have to do when you are, yeah. when you're doing a big project. Is like, how long will this take me and how worth it is the result going to be for the time it takes me? And when it comes to drawing a single character multiple times on a page, it's like, 
I cannot be taking hours and hours every time I have to draw this figure. I need to take minutes to draw this figure so I can actually finish this. That's um, actually one suggestion that I would have is um, if you want to practice uh, figuring out what details are the most important, put a timer on your drawing, like one minute. Yes. That way, whenever you draw Ooh. your character, um, you can still add as many details as you can in that one minute, but it's going to get you to think about what are the most important characteristics of this character I'm trying to draw, and you will like be sure to include that. And you can do it multiple times as well. You can iterate on that one minute, um, but that will f f basically refine down your character design to its barest essentials, the most important parts of it that makes that character that character. Yeah. In the vein of um, things that you heard that changed your perspective on things, uh, I go by Hank's 80% rule. And that mm -hmm. is that, like, don't give it 100% because if you do that, you will burn out. Just give it 80%. Just when you get whatever you're working on up to 80% done, call it done and go on to the next thing. And that has, like, helped me so much to realize, like, I if there is this, like, particular, like, shot that I want to add in a video and it's going to take, like two hours that's going to be condensed down to 30 seconds or like to two seconds or something, maybe don't do that because the video is passable without it. And it's, it's better off just going to 80% rather than pushing it to a hundred. Yeah. We love this, the 80% rule here at OSP. <laughs> this might also help you establish a simplified style as well, because I have like my own yeah. kind of refined, like polished up style. And then I have like a secondary simple style of what I do whenever I draw little chibis and like little yeah. characters. So I would suggest experimenting with that as well. Like trying out, okay, if I were to draw this character just with the most simple basic shapes and colors, if I have like 10 seconds to draw them, like do that practice. Just continue with those like one minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Try it out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this next question comes from Worm on the Web. What is one thing you think you draw the most? Is there one thing you find you will draw by default if given a pen and paper? Ooh, My bunny. <laughs> oh. oh, circles are, I start everything with circles. Mm -hmm. I can't help that. Um, but yeah, I have like a little bunny character that is like the <gasps> unofficial official mascot for my channel. Um, I drew this when I was in like ninth grade and then I was showing like my old drawings on my channel and people were like, what's that? We like that. So I was like, okay, sure. I'll draw more of them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I draw my little bunny character on like everything. That's I don't think I, I have anything. I just do faces. I, I start with characters. It's yeah. what about the me. what about the gabo, Joe? No, do I don't that? default to drawing the no. gabo. I draw the gabo very deliberately when I need to. Um, it used to be when I was in high school, I would default to drawing trees, but that's because I actually wanted to draw big titty anime girls, but I was too embarrassed. <laughs> um, but the tree now, is the second best thing. <laughs> but now I don't. I don't really have. I think I do default to drawing like a little squat guy, like a like a simplified. He's kind of brick-like, and he's got little triangle feet, and it's just a, I don't know, just a thing that I like to draw doing different poses. Maybe he's running, maybe he's jumping, maybe he's slashing a sword. Sometimes I'll just draw a little squat guy. I know exactly which one you're talking about, too, because I've seen you, I've seen you draw this, like, or, like, your character doing the little, like, goblin squat. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, that, that little yeah. goblin squat, yeah, I mean, gremlin squat. I assume we all went through a phase where we were drawing anime eyes on everything, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I remember my first job, I used to draw it on the receipts when I didn't have customers. <laughs> I would just be there, like, drawing anime eyes. What did your anime, anime eyes look like? Mine were, like, semi-circles, like the, the, this uh, half circle, just, like, with oh. a big old round thing that takes up most of the whites of the eyes with, like, massive, two massive highlights in the iris. Oh, of course. Mine was, like like Yu-Gi-Oh style like scowling uh Ooh. like the Mine serious the Pokemon. oh yeah Pokemon. the big tall ovals that are like that thin mm. yeah I never understood that one to be honest I'm like the iris has to be round why would you do it anything else I understand I it because I implement that in my style still my irises are slightly more oh. vertically shaped than uh hmm. they're more than ovally. you would normally draw I normally quote unquote of uh how they actually look I don't know I just like them to look a little bit taller, not stretched out like old Pokemon or anything where it's right. practically a aligned, but I don't know. Yeah. It just looks oh, nice man. to me. Yeah. My early comic layouts, not not anything that ever got published, but when I was drawing just comics for my own fun, there would always be so many dramatic close-in shots of a single <laughs> eye. I was like, I've trained for this. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, this yeah. next question comes from Catboy Chris. What's your favorite aesthetic? Oh, boy. Ooh. We talking like cottage core, goblin core, dark academia. However you want to interpret Tumblr the word stuff. aesthetic. Huh. I'm here to read the questions, not tell you how to live your life. <laughs> mm. I kind of want to say cottage core. I like like witch core, which Ooh. is like darker cottage core. Right. Um, very autumnal Halloween decorations twenty four seven. Exactly. Like yeah. living in a spirit Halloween. And then of course just like red, black, and white. Well, yeah. Are like fully my aesthetic and everything. Yeah, I was gonna Naturally. I was gonna mention, like I love your background right now. <laughs> oh well thank you, thank you. I also like cottage core. I think uh, that's such a broad question because it's like yeah. that's like asking what is your favorite food? And it's like, okay, well, I have a favorite dessert. I have a favorite breakfast. I have a favorite, you know, um, big meal. I have a favorite snack, you know. Favorite it's drink. Like favorite mm. drink. It's, uh, I really like, um, I'm, this is going to upset a lot of people, but I, I want to like go into detail about what I mean. <laughs> I really like pixel art, but pixel art is not an art style. I want to get that clear. Pixel art yeah. is not an art style. Pixel art is a medium in yeah. which the art style uh-huh. can come from. Uh, yeah, because, sense. like, you cannot tell me that uh, freaking Mega Man Battle, Battle Network and, I don't know, uh, Nidhogg have the same art style. They don't, but they're both pixel art. Um, that said, I really like this sort of old GBA limited palette, but still more polished than the Super Nintendo one that I really like is Final Fantasy Tactics. This sort everything has a sort of old tan brown sort of I don't know. It's like it was dipped into a can of tan paint. And I kind of <laughs> like that slight brown tint on everything in everything this uh, specifically for t- pixel art. I I do not like it when it comes to the early 7th gen of consoles where everything was brown and gray. Uh but yeah, I think Final Fantasy Taxic, uh, Tactics has been one of my favorite styles of pixel art. It, it just looks a little bit grungy, just a little bit gritty, but it's still very bright and colorful. I didn't think I had an answer to this, but I absolutely do. Um, Castle in the Sky. Spe- Castle. So, so Ooh, Ghibli like aesthetic, the... but specifically the most sunny greenest grass mm-hmm. big fluffy like clouds open spaces mm. open spaces like... open sky crumbling ruins overgrown with greenery giant robots uh poignant meditations on the nature of hubris and destruction honestly that movie is like a good 70 percent of my personality um so uh, and then of course breath of the wild was like hey i heard you like all this shit <laughs> so <laughs> yeah the only thing that's making tears of the kingdom better for me Flying islands on top of all the other stuff. They they know exactly who they're catering to, and it's me. <laughs> Ooh, oh, if yeah. we're talking about designs and not just like color palette and stuff, flying islands is absolutely an aesthetic that I love. Oh yeah, yeah. Everything beats flying islands. So Everything's yes. better. Kiki's, Kiki's delivery island. service. Oh yeah. That's it's that one. the witch aesthetic of like living in the woods and like same thing like the the cottage core overgrown like mm-hmm. yeah I love that. Perfect. Incredible. The next question comes from Lucy the Duchess. Do you ever use custom brushes when making your webcomic or just any sort of digital art? A lot of custom brushes going around. In uh, the, I have it, special brushes that I like the only brushes I've ever purchased. They're the like ones that I use all the time and they're specifically designed for drawing like manga and anime. Hmm. Um, but I use uh, Procreate. So yeah, take, take that as as you will. In the um, most barest, like, bare bones way, because my brush is just the default paint tool side brush with fuzzy static up to 40. There we go. I just re- re- revealed how I do my line art. That's it. How to make things in Joe Cat style. So I encountered a tutorial years ago, how to make custom brushes for Clip Studio Paint. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, and it's brushes that I've made. Uh, and in fact... I, I sometimes make new ones in the middle of something because the easiest way to make a magic circle with runes around the outside that say something is to type that out in runes. And I have a font for this because I like I like streamlining. I like efficiency. So I have fonts for, for the runic alphabets. Uh, so you type that out. You, you register it as a brush tip shape. You go into the ellipse tool. <laughs> you, you go into the brush tip shape feature there. You 
click the runes you just put in there, and then you can make an infinitely tessellating magic circle with that pattern. And you don't need to go through all the hassle of individually bending it out into a perfect circle. So... So that's good. I, I I made even more brushes to try and shortcuts. Like I did a braid pattern, I did a chain pattern, I did some vines, and I've used them in videos, but I've discovered that I don't like them for the comic. Like I tried, I even have a foliage brush I made because I was like, early on in my how do I draw trees journey, I was like, I'll just make a brush for it. And then it was like, no, this is like, yes, but now the, now the tree is way too detailed and it shouldn't be. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be in the background. Um, so I found a completely unrelated shortcut for it and used that instead. Uh, but having a foliage brush and like uh, like a vines brush, it is useful just for just for a little fun background stuff, but not as useful as I thought it would be. I feel the same way. I feel like when you start to use brushes for like uh, patterns, things like chains, mm -hmm. they end up looking like either really flat or really like computer generated. It just looks yeah. a little off. Whereas it doesn't like, really match oh, well, your style exactly. Yeah, it's like a yeah. normal chain would like maybe twist a little bit, but if they're all just kind of flat, then it bup, bup, bup. Yep. Just it starts work. to stick out. Yeah. So I think a lot of us went through the phase of like, oh man, I could I could shortcut so many things with a precision brush for this, and then it's like, oh, thanks, but I'm actually good doing this manually because I've figured out a way to make this work that actually fits my style rather than finding a shortcut to do a ton of work very quickly. The only exception being magic circles because mm -hmm. I love them so much. <laughs> Incredible. This question comes from Sadib. To all, what is your second favorite color? Ooh. Second favorite. Second favorite. Not your first. I know. I know. I actually know this one Ooh. because I've thought about this. So I have a very strict color palette of like black and red. <laughs> if you see it in my videos, all of my like media, everything I buy is all like black and yes. red. But um, the one color that I really love, apart from that, where I'm like, oh, if I could change all of my color palette, I would change it to this. If I could change my, like, brand aesthetic, I would change it to this. And it's just, like, bright cyan. Like, mm. like that pure, like, like that one spot. green, kind of? Kind of, yeah. Because that's also my answer. <laughs> like, like this. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Like a... Yeah, those bright who, cyan. Those who are listening and can't see, Echo just showed the bluer part of her Animal, Animal Crossing, Crossing Nintendo Switch. Mm -hmm. um, so if you need a reference, you can look that up. Yeah. yeah. I don't tend to have favorite colors, except it is absolutely that kind of like seafoam green, you know, the sea on a really bright sunny day, uh, the specific color of Andrea's hair in Reboot, uh, that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. That was the first color of nail polish I ever had. And I don't even wear nail polish, but I just, I just love that sort of iridescent opalescent blue. Um, but I don't work it into any of my, uh, actual possessions, so it can't be my favorite color. It's just every time I see it, I'm like, ah, oh, instant serotonin. So. Mm -hmm. I, this might come as a surprise. It is my branding yellow, the one that I use for all my logo stuff. That is my second favorite color. Um, and it has risen up to that point. And yellow was not really a color that I really liked until it became my branding and I started to grow fond of it. Um, You've told yeah. me this before. I think that's so funny because you are like such a Hufflepuff dandelion <laughs> spiritually that I feel Thanks. like it just, it suits you. It's like such a beautiful, it's like a soft masculine color. Mm. I feel like yellow is, yellow is a very, it can be very beautiful color. Yeah. Color. And it I has feel definitely like it, gotten more representation as time has gone on. Like with yeah. uh, Inside Out, Joy is Yellow. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And I feel like those just, like, all of the things that are kind of associated with yellow suit you as a, as a personality. Oh, Aww. thanks. Team Instinct, shout out. Yeah. <laughs> boo. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm Valor. Valor, yeah, I obviously. Should boo. <laughs> I don't play Pokemon Go. I just know that that's the meme, that's the meme team, and that's all that matters to me. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, this next question comes from Pillow. Uh, when beginning to write or create characters, how do you start? Um, so maybe from a character design standpoint, you know, how do you go about putting pen to paper and making this person come Ooh, to life? I actually am very excited. Can I go first? Yeah, go for it. Uh, because this goes into how I write my D and D characters is, uh, I write them a simple, uh, a simple history. Like, uh, I'll give an example that red might recognize simple history. They own a tavern where they get it from their dad. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is their motivation? They want to make it a nice one and continue their legacy. Flaw. They are bad at it. <laughs> it's like, those are like the rules I write for my D&D &D characters and I think for any character. And then if I need a deeper character, I flesh them out from there. Um, there's a, a person who is... Uh, 
let me think like uh another D D character my goblin boy who's got like a magical sword and shield um history he left his tribe to join these people because he saw a valiant knight and he wants to be a knight now uh motivation he wants to protect others just like he was protected by the knight flaw he is a little bit childish and ignorant and naive and believes that uh heroing is all fun and games boom yeah i That's feel really like I, I i i tend to and this is probably not a great way this might be controversial i tend to go with more like visual aesthetic because a lot of the time i'll be inspired by something visual and then I'll end up doing some like the underlying characteristics of like, oh, well, this person is wearing this like cool red dress. Why? And then like build on from there. That's definitely um, a way to do things, you know, design yeah. them visually yeah. and then answer questions through those visuals. I, I feel like I have like four different answers for this for different things. Um, There's a lot of ways to make characters. Well, part of it is that like specifically for D&D, I often start with a very, very basic essentially like a prompt like an improv prompt and i've never taken improv so like don't at me if i'm getting this wrong but like it because because in my experience so much of the experience of playing a ttrpg is based on the table the dm and you know what happens to this character so i think if you go in with too much of a character and a plot already mapped out you risk having that all go off the rails or getting distracted or disoriented or just like you end up playing off another character at the table in a way you weren't expecting uh, and it just completely shifts the way things work. So so I often start with just an incredibly basic premise. Um, with my, my character in Rolling with Difficulty, the, uh, the D&D podcast I'm on with Sophia, uh, I basically was just like, I, I don't know much about D&D 5e. Uh, I want to play something that's simple so that mechanically I'm not getting bogged down and I don't slow down the thing because I've never done an actual play before and it's scary. So I think I want to be a monk because that seems pretty simple. I feel like she can really only do a couple things in combat, and that's good. And I, I think uh, her her motivation is she wants to see the world. The world is big and cool, and she was in this monastery, and she left. And I don't know if she was right to leave, but uh, she, she wants to see the world, and the monastery didn't want her to do that. Like, kind of an Aang style. Like, she doesn't really know what she's doing. She doesn't really know the true nature of whatever grand destiny the monastery had. She's just Audi. She's kind of a self-motivated, ultimately kind of a selfish person. Um, and Austin was like, all right, cool. And then it was like, by the way, mind flares. <laughs> so like, I didn't know that was coming. Um, and the way this character grew was mostly in relation to how she played off the other players. And, um, ha I had an idea like at the end of season two about like, I think I want her to multi-class. I, you know, I think I actually, she's realizing that she has no agency in her life and even being a monk is something that was chosen for her. So I think let's explore that. And that wasn't something I would have thought up early on. Um, but that's specifically for how it works for a TTRPG, where it's like, I, I'm i really only in control of like a tenth of what happens to this character. <laughs> um, I, I played a character in a one shot that uh, Austin also ran, where literally the only thing was like, he's a paladin, he's kind of a himbo. Uh, he, he wants to help people. That's kind of his entire thing. Uh, and it, that it didn't really get much chance to develop beyond that. It was a one shot. Um, <laughs> and that was fine. It was easy to play. But for characters in storytelling, it's completely different because I get to decide everything that they go through and everything that happens to them. So I get to sort of know from the start what sort of arc I want them to play out. Um, and even if they surprise me along the way, it's not, you know, it's not the same thing as having to sort of work around other people's storytelling. Uh, so I can start with a lot more specific details. I usually work through the main beats of the backstory. Sometimes I'll sit down with my sketchbook and just draw a page of expressions and little moments and lines and just like, I don't know what they are what they mean when they say this, but I know it's in character for them and that tells me something. Um, and it's, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's, I, I don't really know how I do this. It hasn't fucked me over yet, so I guess I'm doing it right, okay. But um, one, yeah, oh, oh, you can go first. Okay, uh, one exercise, and this is not a suggestion for anyone to take it. I'm just saying what I like to do um, because it's fun. This exercise that I like to do sometimes whenever I do find a character that I'm like, okay, I need to flesh this one out. I need to think, I, I make it uh, the more deep and like have more to them is I like to take the character and I like to ask myself moral and ethical 
conundrums for them. Mm -hmm. And then it helps me figure out, okay, what does this character value? What do they hold as very important? I'll give myself a question like, okay, this character has just found a thing like that will change their life. Like, I don't know, a bunch of money. They're, let's say they're poor. They find a bunch of money just on the street and it's theirs now and it could change their life. But then they overhear that someone else uh, also needs this life-changing amount of money and they actually do own it. They could run away with it. No one would know and there are no long-term repercussions. Do they? You know, ask myself mm-hmm. questions like that. Or, oh, this character has... Um, Let's say they have to help their friend, but um, their friend needs to do something that is going to hurt the feelings of another friend. Something like that. It's like, what do they do there? Uh, And that's going to differ from character to character. And I think that helps me differentiate these characters as well is by having not too many... Whenever there's like a larger cast with like... Or cast of characters that are together a lot... I let's say three traveling characters that are always going to be together. I like to give each of them a different answer to all these questions so that they're mm. not so similar. Yeah, actually, that is when it comes to developing groups of characters, I find mm. it's very helpful to make sure that these characters will never be 100% thinking and feeling the same thing about the same situation. Yes. Uh, it's okay if they act this, like, obviously, you know, when you have a team of good guys, you probably want them to do. Good guy stuff, but it's like this character, like I've used the example of like Team Avatar from Last Airbender. It's like, okay, like they're all going to do the right thing, but Toph is in it because she's kind of just having a good time and Guitar is in it because she's an actual hero with a heroic motivation and Aang is in it because he knows it's his job and Sokka's in it because Katara's is going to do it and he needs to watch out for like everyone's doing the right thing, but for a completely different reason and they all feel differently about it. So and how building... they do it is unique yes. as well. That's a thing that I learned in animation is um, mm-hmm. how to differentiate a character is animating them differently doing the same thing how do they walk how do they run how do they lean over to pick up an object and that goes into character motivation as well how does ang help this old man how does Mm -hmm. toph help this old man it's going to be very different yeah Uh, i was going to suggest uh character sheets because that's another Mm -hmm. big one if you just like google character sheets you can find just like sheets with like 50 different questions of like what does what's your character's favorite food why is it why is that their favorite food? What's their culture like? Uh, just like tons and tons and tons of different questions that you can actually like use to tease out who your character is. Yeah. If you, uh, And also just sort of, I guess, not to negate that, but that's definitely a good thing. But the, the reason why I rarely do that is because I don't like locking in a lot of stuff about a character before I know what they're going to need to do for the purposes of the plot. So it's like, if the character's favorite food doesn't matter... And then at some point in the plot, it's like, oh, I can have it be that, like, this is actually, like, their childhood. Like, they remember this. And and if I'd written that down earlier, I would have had to scrap it or make something else up. Uh, So the more stuff you kind of leave vague, which I guess is my main thing (laughs) at this point, uh, the more you can sort of weave together as the needs of the story progress with the caveat that stuff might not make sense when you yeah things later. You could actually have, like, a living character sheet where it's like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, now I need to, like, write that down so it's like... Yeah. Now, like, I've made a note of it in, like, a, a character sheet sort of thing, so you can, like, develop the character more and more. Here's like one that. thing that I want to suggest to young and upcoming writers, or not so young, but still upcoming writers. If it is not, if either it is not important to the plot, or it has not come up in a way that has become important to the plot or character, make it malleable. Mm-hmm. Like, yes. don't set it, don't set it in stone unless very, you absolutely know for sure that this is going to be a thing that is either going to contribute to the plot or yeah. the character development. One of the most thing, fun things I've experienced writing and both playing games is like when my character surprises me by being like, hey, I actually have a very strong opinion about this thing. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, let's play into that. Yeah. Whereas, like, yeah. So, you know, it's just. Let the character just kind of be alive in your head and, and yeah. get their opinion on stuff. Like it, it feels like if, if you're you know if you're if you're doing a character right, a lot of the time they'll tell you. Yeah, if yeah. that makes any sense, like you can just stop and think about them and ask. Yeah, them what would almost, they think about this? What do you think about this in your head and come up with a response mm-hmm. from their perspective? Yeah. So oftentimes it's it's less about writing down like this is what they think about this. This is how they feel about this and more being like, all right, I've got like the the core of their character enough that they have like a a forming personality. And then I'll be like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Like or even like, hey, if I put you in this trolley problem, 
Are you <laughs> going to be able to come to a solution or are you just going to be paralyzed with indecision because you don't want to do anything bad? Like, that's an acceptable answer for my purposes as a writer. Um, yeah. In fact, I want to throw a prompt at the listeners. Ooh, uh, homework. Your, yeah, Whoa. homework. Fun homework. Your character is a wedding planner. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you think, oh, they would never be a wedding planner. That's not the point of this exercise. Um, they're a wedding planner, whether you want, uh, whether they want to or not. But uh, they they mess up the wedding. It doesn't matter if they're very competent. It doesn't matter if they love weddings. They mess it up. How? <sighs> Ooh. I like that. How would this character, either intentionally or accidentally, uh, mess up this wedding? So stressful. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice right, little bit of luck. homework for our listeners as we jump into uh, the last question we have for this podcast before we mm -hmm. bring it on home. So, Red, consider this your five-minute warning for improvising mm -hmm. an outro for this show. Oh, Not um, if I stretch this question out as far as it'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, it's coming for you. Uh, this question comes from Arachnovolt. If you were given an infinite budget and resources, what ultimate creative work would you make? Oh, oh gosh. I feel like I would say a cartoon. Mm. I would love to, like, assemble a team and be able to, you know, come up with characters and situations and write episodes and, like, just produce, like, one to two seasons of a cartoon. Yeah. That would be really good. I mean, I feel I like... I can go if you need time. Yeah, I, I don't even know if I have an answer to this one, actually. <laughs> um... But yeah, if you have one. Yeah, I would love to make an RPG, um, like an open world RPG. It doesn't have to be massive. It doesn't have to be 50 times the size of GTA V or anything like that. Um, I want a high fantasy RPG with like the big open world um, kind of procedural, not procedurally generated, but procedural AI interaction that Skyrim has, but with good writing and a fleshed out <laughs> world. Um, and I would want like a dialogue system that the first like portion of the game, maybe like the first quarter of it is you deciding your character's backstory through improv, like, like a bunch of dialogue Ooh. choices, like a character's like, why have you come to this town? And then you have all these choices of like, I've come to see a family. I've come to pay off a debt. I've come to blah, blah, blah. And you are developing your character. Instead of like writing down uh, the backstory in the character creator, developing the character backstory as you're playing. Like I would love an RPG like that. And with good combat, give it Elden Ring combat. Like mm. there's so many RPGs with like that just don't scratch that itch for me. But Elden Ring, as fun as it is, doesn't have like a living, breathing world. You know, it's got, it's a yeah. dilapidated world that's already dead and you're there to pick up the pieces. Right. Um, Which makes it a lot easier to populate with only random things to fight. Rather yes, than like yes. A but I would love, I would love an RPG that, that plays gameplay combat wise like Elden Ring, but with like a nice, well written characters and world that's living and breathing and with towns that I can just get lost in. Maybe a few minor life sim things, like a buying a house and a farm, um, because I, I keep playing life sim games because I just want an escape from the world and its problems sometimes, <laughs> uh, and just get lost in the world for, for a couple of hours. And yeah, and with like a fun art style, it's, it's like a dream game of mine that I've... Uh, lamented will probably never be made because games are expensive but yeah, if i had an unlimited budget that's kind of what i'm thinking it's like it it can't be anything that i think i could actually make in my life so it's not like oh i'd make you know like i want to do like the aurora like comics like i'm gonna do that anyway it's like oh i want to be a aurora cartoon that could theoretically happen without infinite money and a team and also would probably be bad um but like you don't know that I don't know that. It would be great if it was cool, but in my head, the ideal form of this is the comic. Anything else is icing. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be something like like some pie-in-the-sky thing that you need infinite money and resources for. And initially, I was thinking like some kind of open-world MMO thing that's like in the world of the, the comic with like all you can be any one of these cool people or you can fight any one of these cool monsters you can go to all these cool places space aurora that's the thing i've been fucking around with in the back of my head is like the thing i don't have time for but want to do but then i was like i don't know like some kind of like middle earth land like actual real like <laughs> you know 
if you had infinite money to build a theme park, it would probably be pretty cool, right? Like, that would solve most of the problems of theme park development, where there's never enough money. Hmm. Um, and I was, ju- I was recently at the, uh, the Hobbiton outside set in New Zealand, and it's nice, but it's very much a movie set. And I was like, we could have had, like, a Galaxy's Edge situation somewhere for Middle mm. Earth. That would be cool. Infinite money, that was the, that was the parameters of the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think with infinite money, there could you be some... a theme park... I, well, I don't necessarily know if I, I've never even been to a theme park. I just think it would be cool uh, to have that exist with infinite money behind it. Maybe, maybe then the theme park would actually be cool and worth my time. Mm. Um, oh, now, now that I'm thinking even bigger, like with yeah. infinite money, because yeah. I was just more thinking a realistic amount of money that yeah, could, I was that a big like corpo could an get. An artistic fulfilling, yeah, type artistic thing. fulfilling. But if we want to go even bigger, infinite <laughs> amount of money theme parks, I was thinking. Um, Oh, this is going to sound really awful to start, but uh, okay. bear with me. I was thinking, like, I would love to do, like, a Westworld style thing of, like, a Woo! like a theme park <laughs> without the ethical, que- you know. We created the, the Torment not... Nexus from the hit story. <laughs> Don't create the Torment Nexus. <laughs> yeah, without, I'm not going to try and recreate, you know, uh, sentience and consciousness in AI or, like, promote violence or anything like that, but just, like... I just want to live in a fantasy world, man. Like, mm. I just want to go to like to White Run and just like run a a thing where I got to go kill goblins or or whatever <laughs> ethically okay and not questionable thing to do that an they're just non sentient robot goblins. Non sentient robot goblins, goblins that don't actually have a consciousness, so that yeah. it's ethically okay to slash them with a sword. The same thing with like rules. infinite money. I would just like build walkable communities and like basically communes and oh, just Disney give them World. away and be like hey here come come live here i'll teach you how to garden and build your own like tiny house and then <laughs> just keep building more and more of those yeah well, infinite like, money is base. too big of a question it's too infinite big of a, money, I a, money def- yeah i have a better less um problematic way to put it i want to be a a medieval fantasy pest control person there you go <laughs> yeah because <laughs> that's what that's all of what adventurers are right you go Just to the cellar to kill and kill rats centipedes yeah. and your pest rats. your pest control yeah so glamorous i love it mm-hmm. uh i don't know if there were any good answers to that question there. <laughs> <laughs> there are never good answers Hope which means they're, they're never bad answers yeah and yeah, also means we've come to the end of this podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, thank you to all of our guest artists for joining us on this episode. It's been a yeah. real thrill. It was fun. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah. us. This was super cool. I, I almost wish there were more questions that we could go into. If only there's um, a way to delay you having to do the outro even longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've seen through my cunning ruse. Uh, well, uh, of course, thank you to our lovely guests for, for joining us on this special bonus artist pod episode. This was super fun. Um, and thank you all for listening. We'll be back uh, some amount of time from now on the regularly scheduled upload day for the normal Wednesday podcast. Sure. Yes, <laughs> which is bi-weekly. Not that bi-weekly. The other bi-weekly. Um, and I don't know when this episode is going up, so I can't give you a more detailed roadmap to how we'll get there, but we'll figure it out. You'll know. Um, I think that about covers our stuff. Of course, there will be videos on Friday. That's kind of our usual MO. Um, and of course, if, uh, if you want to find our guests uh, elsewhere, uh, we will have stuff linked in the description, I'm sure. But also, if you guys would like to say, uh, you know, where yeah. people can find you, what you do. Most of my stuff is on YouTube. Just search Echo Gillette or Echo is Weird, and I come up and usually the first one. Yeah. Um, and then other than that, I'm on Twitch a little bit. I, I'm trying to be on Twitch more. I just launched, like, a VTuber thing. Oh, heck yeah. Um, hell yeah. And then, oh gosh, I guess Twitter? Those are kind of my main <laughs> platforms. Nice. Joe? Uh, you can find me where I'm not talking about how much I want to indulge in cautionary tale fiction. Uh, on YouTube, Joe Cat, twitch.tv slash Joe Cat, um, where I live stream uh, every monday tuesday depending on when you listen to this podcast um <laughs> if it is still 2023 uh i monday tuesday thursday friday i'm doing the joe mega protocol to raise money for trans rights while i beat up a robot that is absolutely killing me it has killed me 600 times now um with yeah. a bunch of other final fantasy players uh wednesdays i run heart of Alinthi with red who is yeah. also one of the players in there um and Ooh. that's all on twitch.tv slash Joe Cat. Uh, I also have uh, Joe Cat 105 on Twitter. Um, 
And that's it. Fantastic. All righty. Well, until next time, I have been Red. These have been my lovely guests. Blue will be Yay. back from wherever he is right now. Uh, <laughs> and this has been an overly sarcastic podcast. Thanks so much for listening to this very special bonus episode of the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. Normal episodes will resume on May 10th, but if you've got any questions for us before then, you can head over to Ask OS Pod on Discord for a chance to be featured in a future episode. If you enjoyed the show, please rate us and leave a review on your preferred podcast platform. And if you really enjoyed the show, consider becoming a patron. Links to all that and our guests, Joe Cat and Echo's content can be found in the show notes below.